the human body and the bodies of a lot of animals in the animal kingdom are able to produce their own cannabinoids to do all sorts of things in the body. But the story of how we learned what the endocannabinoid system is, is a fascinating story and it's not over. So to tell the story properly, we've got to at least go back to the 1800s. Well, let's talk about a man named William O'Shaughnessy. William O'Shaughnessy was a doctor and he ended up traveling to India and he saw that people there were using these intoxicating varieties of cannabis to treat all sorts of medical conditions. So O'Shaughnessy takes this cannabis from India, brings it to the UK and starts studying on animals, children, adults. And he does a lot of research that will probably not get approved by ethics committees today. And he found some interesting results. One thing he found is that cannabis seemed to help quite a bit with seizures and spasticity. He also found that in a lot of the things that he studied, even if cannabis didn't necessarily make the symptoms go away, it tended to make them a little easier to live with. And O'Shaughnessy also reported that cannabis didn't exhibit any significant negative safety profile, and certainly none like alcohol or opium and other drugs of abuse that O'Shaughnessy was familiar with at the time. This is an early insight that gets echoed over and over again as medical research continued around cannabis. But we didn't know why cannabis worked. No one knew. So after O'Shaughnessy's work in the 1800s, you really started to see a following of researchers that wanted to ask these questions and study them and take them seriously. So even in the United States, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, cannabis research was taking off, all trying to answer this question. How does cannabis affect the body? Why do people get high? Those were really the main driving questions. There were a series of technological innovations that started to happen in the early 1900s that really helped scientists better answer this question. Unfortunately, it's also in the early 1900s that we started to get modern cannabis prohibition, at least in the United States. And although there was great research that was going on in the United States all the way up until around 1940, the Marijuana Tax Act started to be implemented modern cannabis prohibition started, and then cannabis research in the United States and in a lot of other places around the world ground into a halt. Jump forward a couple of decades, throughout the 50s and early 60s, there were a series of inventions that came out that were highly relevant to the discovery of the endocannabinoid system. One invention that came out in the early 50s was gas chromatography. And these were systems that were able to take complex chemical mixtures, usually in the form of a liquid. They were injected into a machine, vaporized instantly, and then they travel through a small tube for a long distance, usually 15 to 30 meters. And along that way, all of the chemicals in that gas mixture start to tumble around in that tube slightly differently, and they start grouping up. And then over time, they start to come out the other side together, and they pass across a little flame that flickers, and the amount of flickering that that flame does tells the researcher how much carbon, roughly, is passing through. And in that way, not only could you then separate complex mixtures in ways that was not possible before, especially to study things like volatile compounds, this also gave researchers a new way to measure the concentrations of those compounds to get a sense of how much was actually in a plant. It was then in the late 50s that another technology came on board called NMR, or Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. And this technology is still in use today, as well as gas chromatography. NMR helps us understand the atomic constituents of a molecule in really precise ways, so that we can characterize that molecule and understand its properties. This is usually the first step of identifying something that has never been identified before. Once a compound has been identified using NMR, there are usually reference standards that are then made of that chemical, and then researchers can study that chemical using things like gas chromatography and other chromatography techniques to look for that compound in other things. In the early 60s, a researcher in Israel named Raphael Meshua took note of the advancements that had happened in the past decade because he was able to see the onboarding of gas chromatography of NMR and other techniques, advanced distillation techniques and things like that. 
and realized that it was possible to continue the work of many of the chemists that have been trying to understand this question, how does cannabis work? And in fact, his research group came together and they studied this question. There's a great documentary that's available for free all about this called The Scientist, and I really recommend you look it up. In 1963, Raphael Mishulam and his research team used NMR to characterize CBD. And CBD had already been discovered in 1940, actually in hemp extract in Minnesota, of all things. But um, NMR had never been used to try to really understand whether we had an appropriate characterization of the molecular structure of CBD. So Rafi's team in 1963 publishes a paper that better characterizes CBD than we've ever seen before. Then in 1964, they publish another paper identifying um, THC as the prime intoxicating component of cannabis. Now, Rafi's team is not the first to actually identify THC. THC was known already and had been identified. However, they were the first ones to isolate it and feed it to dogs and see that it got the dogs high. So this was a major, major finding. And they were also the first ones to use NMR to properly characterize the atomic structure of THC. This sent the research world into a tailspin because then once they knew that THC was the primary intoxicating compound in cannabis, well, then they want to know why, how does it work? What's it doing in the body? Initially, researchers thought, well, maybe THC is affecting the membranes of cells or something that's changing the way that they work. And it would be a while until the 80s until the first cannabinoid receptors were discovered. And it's a really interesting story that I elaborate more on in one of my talks that I've given. There's actually a video of it. I'll throw up the link on here. It wasn't until the late 80s that we discovered the first cannabinoid receptor. Once the first cannabinoid receptor was discovered, then the question came, why do these receptors exist? The body must be producing some endogenous compound to interact with these receptors. And so a search went on in the early 90s, the CB2 receptor, so the second cannabinoid type receptor was discovered. And then also in the early 90s, we got the discovery of the first endogenous compound in the body to be known to interact with these receptors. So it was in the early 90s that the very first endocannabinoid was discovered endogenous compound that interacted with these cannabinoid receptors. And it was in arachidonyl ethanolamine, also known as anandamide. And it gets its name from the Sanskrit ananda, which means bliss. And so the idea is that it's a bliss molecule because it's interacting with CB1 receptors in the brain, as well as CB2 receptors, producing some THC-like effects. But the plot thickens. After anandamide was discovered, researchers discovered another endocannabinoid called 2-AG or 2-arachidonyl glycerol. And this compound, it actually turns out, is more abundant in the body or at least in the brain than anandamide tends to be. And it tends to be more of a potent agonist or stimulator of CB1 and CB2 receptors than anandamide. So although in arachidonyl ethanolamine got this fun fancy name anandamide, that name maybe should have gone to 2-AG instead. But what can you do? That's how the story plays out. At this point, we're starting to get the components of an interesting physiological system coming together here. We've got these endogenous cannabinoids. We've got cannabinoid receptors. And then, of course, associated with each of those things, there are um, different molecular mechanisms responsible for building those things and breaking them down. And so collectively, all of these things the endogenous cannabinoids, the cannabinoid receptors, and the enzymes that are responsible for building and breaking down those endogenous cannabinoids are all referred to in the late 90s as the endocannabinoid system. And this was 1998 that the first real significant research paper that really stuck the flag in the ground saying, this is the endocannabinoid system and this is what it is and how it works. 1998 was the year that that happens. And so everything seemed to be good. When we look at THC, we know that it interacts with CB1 and CB2 receptors. We have an understanding of the endocannabinoid system at this point. Um, so researchers are starting to think we've got a pretty good grasp on how cannabis works. Wrong, it turns out we were wrong, so wrong. So in the early 2000s is when CBD research really starts to pick up again. Um, and something I didn't mention is that in the 
really even in the 70s, there was significant CBD research going on. But then it all kind of stopped once uh, the focus was more on THC and a lot of the money was going to try to figure out how to combat THC intoxication and cannabis use disorder. So in the early 2000s, we start to see a kind of resurgence of CBD research. Researchers are thinking, okay, we've got a good grasp on how THC works, which is one of the most dominant phytocannabinoids found in cannabis. So what about CBD? CBD throws a wrench into this whole story because it turns out CBD doesn't have much affinity for cannabinoid receptors. It interacts with the body in a very different way and it interacts with receptors that modulate the activity of endocannabinoids in really interesting ways, but that don't fit this neat model of the endocannabinoid system. As research continued, a new concept emerged, first called the expanded endocannabinoid system, and then later called the endocannabinoidome, just like the uh, human genome, or the proteome, the metabolome, they're all of these ohms that represent large, complex systems. Well, the endocannabinoidome is one of these complex systems. And in one of the next Quick Questions videos, I'm going to tell you all about the endocannabinoidome and where the research around the endocannabinoid system has led us. It's super, super fascinating, and it's one of my favorite topics. So I look forward to getting into that next time. So just to summarize what we've talked about so far, what is the endocannabinoid system? Well, the endocannabinoid system is kind of a basic concept that refers to endocannabinoids, cannabinoid receptors, and the enzymes responsible for building and breaking down those endocannabinoids. Now, one thing I didn't really get into too much here, but it's worth noting, your endocannabinoid system is not one thing. Your tissues and cells all throughout your body kind of have their own individual endocannabinoid systems that communicate with each other and, and are kind of interconnected to other physiological systems. So this isn't just one thing, it is very the endocannabinoid system is a relatively new concept. It was first really proposed in 1998, and since then it's gone through quite a few expansions and revisions. And it's likely we're going to see more expansions and revisions as we continue to study not just how cannabis affects the body, but also how foods and lifestyle choices influence cannabinoid signaling inside of the body. And then finally we talked about how CBD research particularly really helped researchers understand that there's a lot more going on to cannabis than just the endocannabinoid system. And it's promoted the adoption of this new concept of the expanded endocannabinoid system, also known as the endocannabinoidome. So I hope you found this interesting. I look forward to catching you in the next quick questions. If you don't mind taking the time, please like this video, subscribe and share it with your friends and family. And I look forward to catching you in the next video. Stay curious and take it easy. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe, hit the bell icon so you get notified of more videos, and go ahead and check out another video while you're at it.